My name is Mike Downs, and I'm the superintendent of this American International School here in Evan Yehuda, Israel. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this unbelievably amazing and phenomenal Gaia annual symposium. Welcome. One of your one of your teachers uh, told me today when I asked um, why is Gaia important, she said, "You know, I think the most important lesson that students learn from Gaia is that one person." can make a big difference. And then she said, and actually, when that one person comes together with other people and you work together, unbelievable things can happen, huge things can happen, big change can happen. It's my great pleasure to welcome one person who's had an incalculable impact, a big impact, an unbelievable impact on so many of us in Gaia, in our school, around Israel, and around the world, our own Dr. Fly. This, okay, okay. This uh, beautiful upcycled dog food bag will be selling for at least 1,000 shekels now. But don't all run up at once to try to get it. Anyway, this is pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. My school bag where I bring my lunch, and of course when I go to the beach. All made from things that we would see in the garbage, thrown away onto the street. Nobody would want anymore, making our country look extremely dirty. Getting into the environment, getting into our groundwater, poisoning us without us even knowing, because we don't think about those things. So I want to greet everybody for coming. This is a very powerful group of students that are here. You all, like Mr. Downs had just mentioned, are making an amazing change. One by two by three. We're solving our problems in Israel. We're confronting our problems here in Israel, and we're trying to make a difference. We also have students in the Czech Republic that we travel there, and they come here, and they're making a difference there. And we can be proud that we're part of that. And many of you have met the Czech students over the past few years um, as well. So while I'm just joking and wearing this nice outfit up here, which actually so many people actually want it, um, it's, it's, it's amazing. We had a, a wonderful group of designers come to visit our school. And you could see what could be done with things that you throw away and economically feasible to keep them, to turn them into something else and keep them out of the garbage stream. I learned a new phrase today, cradle to cradle. Awesome, not cradle to grave where you bury it and get rid of it. It's reborn again, it's reused again. Really, three words, cradle to cradle. Pretty amazing. So that's why we're here, all these wonderful schools. At the end of everything, uh, our other guy, our coordinator in the high school, Mary Westcott, will do all the thanks. That way I do not get in trouble if I missed anybody. So I've strategically fixed this so I go first. But uh, 
I do want to mention, between, be, besides the environmental organizations that have been helping us, and again, SP&I was here. SP&I has been here every year very quietly. Today they're above the radar in here. And Ramat Nadiv has been very, very instrumental in kicking off many of our uh, ideas, our projects, especially on invasive species. And uh, again, thanks will come to Russell Alwanger for Tower Jazz. Have they been here from the moment Gaia was born? Uh, making sure every opportunity uh, that our students have ideas, if, if an engineering and technology company could do something, they will do it. And, and the Boeing Corporation, many of you are here together. Your research that you've been showing off today is because of the Boeing Corporation and the funding that they have given to us to have these three-day camp, research camps over the last three years uh, that made a difference. How many of you were on one of those uh, Boeing trips in here? We went out for the three days. A lot of people graduated, only a few people raising their hand. Wow, guess we should have that again. Good idea. Um, I'm gonna turn this over in a minute, but I have, I have to get something, I forgot. I'm not gonna change into other clothes, just one minute. Ah. It's like an, em it's an envelope. I do, in front of everybody, wanna recognize somebody in Gaia that I believe deserves the recognition in front of all 400 plus of you. And it, it's, it's to one of our students. It's a student who has completed seven years of Gaia, has been involved in every research initiative, every field trip, every hug possible. She's our diplomatic hugger of Gaia. Everybody gets together who's scared and is a group here and a group there and doesn't know how to get together and talk. This person has brought them together. She has been the president of our Gaia Junior. She is our Gaia ambassador, student ambassador. She's been the head of Gaia research for the last three and a half years. And um, she's been a member in outstanding service for seven. And I'd like to acknowledge Maya Peleg to come up here right now. Some of you, this is Maya, Hi. big smiles, everybody knows her, she's great. Anyway, we have this program about the chickadees which we're trying to save, and the head chickadee, his name is Yoni. And we've decided that Yoni's wife needs to be called Maya now. So it's Yona and Maya in the book now, Yoni and Maya, so uh, get a look at the book, get a look at Maya in bird form as well. Thank you, Maya. I'd like to call up a member of the U.S. Embassy, Michelle Zira, the Deputy Cultural Attaché, to talk a little bit about some of the projects that they're working on, and especially in connection with Gaia as well. So, Michelle. Well, it's really exciting to see all of your projects and see how you are identifying problems, making observations, collecting information, and solving real problems. This is really exciting to see. So I know you all are navigating school and pursuing your interests and hopefully thinking about how, as you move forward, you can continue to identify problems and solve them and pay attention to the environment and be involved in science. So I thought I would spend a couple of minutes telling you a little bit about my story and my love for science and the environment and the rather unpredictable path that it has taken. So my name's Michelle Zira, and I'm a diplomat with the U.S. Embassy. But ever since I can remember, I wanted to be a veterinarian. So what's a veterinarian? Who knows what a veterinarian is, right? It's a, a doctor for animals, right? Because when I was little, I really wanted to be a veterinarian because I loved animals. So how many of you like begged for the dog and kept lizards in jars and picked fish out of the pond? That was me too. Right? And in high school, I volunteered with our local veterinarian, and I, I planned to go away to university and study veterinary medicine. And at the very last minute, I decided instead 
to go to a liberal arts college. Do you know what a liberal arts college is? In the US, we have a liberal arts college. So you go and you study lots of different subjects, as well as the subject you're interested in. And I studied biology. And at my liberal arts college, Reed College in Portland, Oregon. Anybody been to Portland, Oregon? Any Oregon people here? Great, good. We had to do a final project in our last year of school. So you know I love animals, so I went to Costa Rica. Where's Costa Rica? Central America, right? And I studied tapers for six months in the jungle. Who knows what a taper is? Anybody? Yeah, one person? OK, so tapers, two people? Great. It's a smart group, right? Tapers, they're about this big, and they live in the jungle, and they eat plants. They look kind of like a cross between an elephant with a small trunk and a giant pig. So they're really big. They're not related to either. They're very shy, and they only come out at night. So I spent six months in the jungle during the daytime following their tracks through the forest. And I learned about what habitats they liked, where they wandered in the forest, and I never once saw one. <laughs> so when I decided to go to graduate school and get my PhD, I decided to study botany. <laughs> and what is botany? <laughs> study of plants, because plants are very interesting, and I learned that through studying animals but plants are also always in the same place, so it makes it much easier. So I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Any people have been to Madison, Wisconsin? Yeah? And you know the winters in Madison are very long and they're very cold, and I don't like the cold. I like the weather here in Israel. So I would go every winter to Madagascar. Where's Madagascar? You've seen the movie? It's exactly like it, yeah. And I studied a group of plants, a group of flowering trees that are found no place else on Earth. Because I wanted to understand about tropical forests and their conservation, because they're highly endangered, right? So that's what I did for my research. And then, I went on to continue my research studies and to teach university. But because I think like a scientist, I was really curious about how my students were learning and what worked for them and what didn't work for them. So I became very interested in science education. So together with my students, we tried all kinds of experiments in the classroom to figure out what worked and what did not work. And then I went to Vietnam. Where's Vietnam? <laughs> Southeast Asia, that's right, on a Fulbright scholar. And I went to Rwanda. Where's Rwanda? Africa, and to South Africa. And I worked with teachers on how to be an effective science teacher based on what my students and I had learned together by doing research. Very much like you guys did for your projects by observing, trying different things, and collecting data in order to understand what works. So then, because I was very interested in science and also in education, I helped to start a women's university in Bangladesh. Where's Bangladesh? India. That's right, South Asia, very near India, that's right. That's right, and after I got this university started up and running, I joined the State Department where I can, as a diplomat, help to, to share this passion for science and education in the programs that we do. And we're very excited that here today, one of the projects is a program that we supported. And so I want to have you all cheer out when I read your school. These are the schools that we have supported. So we have Makif Jasir Alzarka. Where are you? Where are you? OK. And we have Bet Sefer Beer Tuvia. Where are you? Okay. And we have the Tomshim Arab High School. Yeah, okay. And the Ort Makif Arab School. 
There we go. Okay. And this is a project supporting girls. This is a project supporting girls doing forensic science. Do you guys know what forensic science is? Who watches CSI? Okay, right. So this is looking, this is very much like all the other projects. You're looking at the crime scene in this case, and you're collecting the evidence, and you're trying to identify the victims, which in this case happened to be, who are the victims, guys? Mice, right, okay. And the perpetrators are barn owls. So if you're intrigued by this, you can visit their booth and get some more information on this. And finally, what I want to say is, I've talked a bit about following my passion for my love for animals and my curiosity about how complex tropical forests evolve and how we can protect them, and my curiosity about science and education. And the adventures have taken me on an unpredictable path through different continents in the world. So I urge you all to follow your passions and to appreciate that science is meaningful in everyday life, whether you're a parent or a consumer of news or a voter that wants to understand your government's policy on, for example, climate change, whether you are a teacher, a research scientist, or a diplomat, that science has tools of critical thinking and of creative insight. And these are two really good, useful tools for whatever paths that you might take. So good luck on your adventures, and I hope that you keep science and the environment close to you. Thank you. OK, I'd like to invite up the two presidents of Gaia to take over this uh, presentation for the evening. Good evening, distinguished guests, students, and teachers. My name is Alexandra Zeltzer. And I am Luima Manuel. And we are the co-student directors of the Global Awareness Investigation and Action Project here at WBAIS. <laughs> we would like to thank you all for being here tonight and for participating in such an amazing project with us. This year in Gaia, we have been focusing on the topic of sustainability. We have been working within the local community, as well as collaborating with schools all over Israel, two schools in the Czech Republic, and the Attica Zoological Park in Athens, Greece. In addition to this, we are cultivating a relationship with the school in Greece that will hopefully join our project in the near future. Together, we have been researching how to develop more sustainable communities. We would like to introduce the Honorable Ambassador Daniel Shapiro to give a global greeting. Ambassador Shapiro has been instrumental in developing Gaia's relationship with the school in Jizr al -Zarka. This collaboration first started with a beach cleanup one year ago in honor of International Coastal Cleanup Day and has since blossomed. And without further ado, please welcome Ambassador Shapiro to the stage. Well, thank you very much for the warm welcome. Good evening, Erev Tov, Masal Kher. I really want to uh, congratulate you, all of you, and it is a pleasure to be uh, here with you tonight to participate in Gaia's uh, sixth annual research symposium. Uh, I want to obviously congratulate uh, Dr. Fly. I was going to call him <laughs> Professor Fleischer, Stuart Fleischer. Uh, Russell Elwanger of Tower Jazz for your wonderful support for the program. And the parents and the teachers, but especially, especially want to congratulate you, the students. I want to congratulate you for the contributions you're making to your own learning, uh, but also to environment, environmental protection, to improving the community you live in, and to making our world a better place to live in. And that's something that uh, is very common uh, to uh, the values that we share uh, from the United States. Uh, I'll tell you a little about that in a moment. 
What I really appreciate and really admire about Gaia and all the participants in it are the concepts that are embedded in its name. Global, awareness, investigation, and action. Those are concepts that the Gaia Scouts live and it tells us a lot about what it means to be a responsible citizen of this world. First, awareness. You gotta know what's going on. You gotta take an interest in what's happening in the problems in your community, in the problems in your city, or your school, or your country, or indeed your world. Second, investigation. You gotta take it upon yourself to look deeper into those very problems, to understand their causes, and most importantly, to find innovative solutions to those problems. Third, action. Don't sit passively. Don't say it's somebody else's problem to solve. Don't say I can't make a difference. You don't. You take action to solve problems with sustainable solutions and to teach others how to solve those problems. And finally, the first word, global. To do all of that with respect to something that we all share, our planet, our environment, the air we breathe, the food we eat, the water we drink, and all of the knowledge that those ideas and actions by individuals, individuals like yourselves, can make a difference globally, can make a difference for the entire world. Now, I just saw some tremendous examples of all of those concepts and all of those principles being put into action in the projects uh, on display upstairs. Really, really incredibly innovative, successful, searching, investigative, and action-oriented, uh, solution-oriented projects uh, with respect to barn owls and turtles and bats and coral and, and so many other aspects of, uh, of our natural world. So I want to congratulate everybody who's taken part uh, in all of those projects. Now those ideas, those concepts, global awareness, uh, uh, investigation action, those are concepts that my boss, President Obama, has applied very much in his approach to uh, working uh, in public life before he was president and as president. His idea is that to address the problems that face us, we have to empower the individuals, empower individual citizens, students, parents, teachers to find solutions to problems and then take responsibility and organize themselves for action, just like you're doing. And so it's in the service, and also to do it in the service of an issue uh, that's been central to the agenda of his presidency and central to what all of you are working on, and that is protecting our environment. So that's included all the initiatives he's undertaken together with so many other countries, which culminated in a historic agreement in Paris to combat the, the, the effects of climate change, which could really threaten life as we know it on this planet. It's come together in all of our efforts to reduce the consumption and polluting effects of greenhouse gases and increase our use of renewable energies, and, 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 and which has doubled in the United States since 2005. It comes in, together in our initiatives to protect our oceans uh, from harmful pollution and, uh, and overfishing. And it comes together uh, in our initiatives to develop and promote new technologies to achieve all of those goals of reducing pollution, climate change, greenhouse gases, uh, and harmful pollution. Here, more locally, and Michelle uh, mentioned it, our embassy tries to be a good local citizen here in Israel uh, and make some similar contributions. So together with Gaia and WBAIS and Makiva Jisr, we organized a cleanup of the beach in Jisr al Zarka. Uh, so the, and we've done the same on other beaches to try to help prevent Israel's beautiful beaches and the ocean uh, just, uh, just across those beaches from being polluted. Uh, we're partners with Friends of Earth Middle East and local Israeli, Palestinian, and Jordanian communities who are working to distor, restore the Jordan River to make it a healthy flowing body of water again, because after all we share, we all share the same water. We're promoting environmental education initiatives that bring Arab and Jewish students together to develop new technologies, and I'm very pr proud to say, promote STEM education for girls. And I'm very proud of all the girls who, whose projects I got to see uh, upstairs. We're promoting exchanges of technologies and ideas and knowledge between U.S. and Israeli companies and U.S. and Israeli officials to learn from each other about new models of renewable energy and water management and sustainability. And we've lent very strong support to the efforts of our wonderful keynote speaker, 
Yossi Abramowitz and many other innovators and uh, entrepreneurs in Israel to build up Israel's solar and other renewable energy resources. And Yossi took me on a great walk on a very rainy day, ironically, through uh, this uh, solar field at Kibbutz Kitura, which has now grown ex extensively. I'm just going to tell us about its growth uh, and uh, what else it will, it will still achieve. So we're right there with you guys, students. We're trying to live the same values that you are. And so for all the participants in Gaia, especially the students, uh, we're proud of you, we're encouraging you, and believe it or not, we're counting on you. We're counting on you to keep increasing your awareness, we're counting on you to keep investigating, we're counting on you to keep taking action, and to keep on being global citizens who can make a difference toward our common goal of protecting our Mother Earth and promoting environmental sustainability. So congratulations for all of the hard work. Here's the thing, you're just getting started. And I know that you have a lot more to contribute and you're gonna build on the successes you've experienced in Gaia in the future. Uh, so congratulations, I wish everyone a wonderful symposium. The second speaker is Mr. Yossi Abramowitz. Mr. Abramowitz is recognized as one of the pioneers of solar energy in industry in both Israel and East Africa. He is the co-founder of the Arava Power Company, Israel's leading solar de uh, developer, which we visited and saw on our Gaia Spring research trip. He has been nominated three times for the Nobel Peace Prize and is the president and co-founder of Energia Global Capital, whose goal is to advance environmental and humanitarian goals of providing affordable green power to underserved populations as a fundamental human right. Please welcome Mr. Yossi Abramowitz. Themselves, moving us all forward. They're the next scientists, musicians, poets, the next makers, dreamers, teachers, and geniuses. They are the next list. It is the manifestation of our dream. So the revolution starts right here, coming in. You can feel now the power of the sun. It's just obvious. It's just the most obvious thing in the world when you're in the desert. And I thought we were gonna build a solar field. Instead, we have to build the entire field of solar energy generation for Israel. I'm Yosef Abramowitz, co-founder of the Arava Power Company here in Israel. Like a bulldog, you just put his teeth in something and doesn't give it up until it is done. Even if Israel were 100% renewable, we wouldn't have saved the planet. I can't believe it, I'm so excited. <laughs> The best place to start in Africa would be in Rwanda, 18 years after the, the genocide. For Rwanda, I'm gonna let it shine. So it has to scale. It has to scale today because we're running out of time. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Go Gaia! Woo! I am so, so filled with hope uh, for this invitation and for being here today. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. You and Julie represent the best of American values and Jewish values. And I think the combination of those is what uh, Susan and I feel privileged to be your friends and, uh, and we feel that you're, 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 you're mentors for us uh, in our lives. Keep up the great work. And, um, and, and really, to the two of you, we, we have very big plans for you, uh, and uh, the world does need you, and congratulate to, uh, congratulations really to, to everybody. Uh, th there is no 
more important issue today than sustainability and, and climate change. Also, Dr. Fly and Mary, I'm sure I'm forgetting lots of people, but uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to be here. We, fine. We just, I have, I have bad news now. Okay, hold on, hold on. We, we just experienced the hottest year on the planet, and it follows many other years of, of, of record-breaking temperatures, and this has implications for everybody on the planet. No one, no one is exempt from, from the implications of this. I work a lot in Africa. We're seeing biblical level droughts that if you are a farmer and you have livestock or you're trying to grow your own food just to feed your family, there are places that your life is in danger. And in more and more, and we're not talking about a couple people or a million people or tens of millions of people. We're talking about hundreds of millions of people whose lives are literally threatened. If, if, if you're a citizen of the Philippines and you're somebody poor, you're probably living on the, uh, closer to the ocean. A year and a half ago, there was a supercharged monsoon. Because of the, the, the waters are rising, because of the melting of the ice caps, and because the waters are getting warmer, what happens when the water gets warmer? There's, so what happens is, is that the, there's more precipitation, right? There's more, there's, there's more, uh, I'm forgetting my English. Uh, steam, thank you, more, more evaporation that goes up. And so when it finally hit the Philippines, 6,300 people were killed. Next time it could be 63,000. Two million people were displaced. Next time it could be 20 million. So this is not theoretical. I think it was theoretical in a sense leading up for our generation, and we heard the Al Gores of, of the world issue their warnings. This, this, is, this is the world that you are going to inherit. I will have some good news. Secretary Kerry and the US government was phenomenal at the Paris climate talks. And, and, and one of the things that Secretary Kerry pointed out, I think it was on Wednesday as things were not going well, and I'll, I'll share a little bit of the miracle of uh, what happened behind the scenes. He said, we have a solution for climate change, and that's called energy policy. Because when we burn the fossil fuels, that's what's leading to the, uh, the increase in the, in the greenhouse gas emissions and the warming. And so what is amazing in terms of putting together influences from the US and Israel is that commercial scale solar energy the model upon which all solar energies are being, all solar fields are being deployed everywhere on the planet is a hybrid US-Israel essentially invention. The first solar field in the world was done by Luz, an Israeli company in the Mojave Desert in California. At one point it supplied 90% of the world's electricity that was being generated from the sun, a remarkable achievement. We had the opportunity to, to found the industry here in Israel, but we really stand on the shoulders of Arnold Goldman, who's an Israeli-American. And so whether or not they're building solar fields in Saudi Arabia or in California, this, this is actually a, a joint US-Israel uh, gift to the world that, that should be celebrated and replicated. I want to tell you the four things that need to happen on the planet and you have to demand it as citizens and as consumers and as children of parents who are consumers, but we can actually roll back climate change. And, and there's four things that need to happen, ready? The first is we have to swap out coal. There's 2,600 coal-fired power plants in the world. That's not a lot, actually. If, if you swap out the burning of coal for natural gas, which is what Israel is doing, one of the good things Israel is doing in this regard, then you've cut by half the greenhouse gas emissions that are, that are most dangerous and most pervasive. You can actually roll back, if, if, we, did it, if we did this, a lot of the negative uh, effects of climate change. It's extraordinary, which is why President Obama has been trying to shut down some of the old power, the coal-fired plants uh, in the States. The second thing that we need to do is invest in storage. Now, some of the, some of the kids here took me out to uh, the solar panels out there as part of the uh, experiment. And after they showed me everything, and you got it all right, by the way, I said, well, what do you do at night, right? How do you, how do you produce power at night? So it's possible to, to power things from the sun at night. 
So you're thinking, how is that possible? Well, you, you see my backpack, right? So I have a solar-powered backpack. I, I was walking around Tel Aviv today, and the sun was, was going into the backpack. I was on the phone, actually. So, but, but then I, I have to go home tonight. I have a long ride home to Jerusalem, and, and my phone is almost dead. And so all day long, the battery has been charging. And so I'm going to charge with the sun tonight on the way home so, so I can talk to my wife and, and, and do my email. Now imagine that multiplied billions and billions of times over for our grids, for our power plants. We can get to 100% solar if we solve storage. The third thing is that we need electric cars. Thank you, whoever organized. I was picked up by a hybrid, a, a Prius. OK, it's good. We tried in Israel, we failed. But it's really, we need to commit as governments to fleets. And we have to make sure that 20% of our fleets by 2020 are all electric. And that means all of your parents, don't let them buy anything but a, but a plug-in car. It's really important. And the fourth thing, which is what I spend my time doing now, is I kill diesel for electrical generation. According to the former CIA director, Jim Woolsey, 9% of the world's electricity is by burning diesel. It's expensive, even today, and it's really expensive for the environment. It's, and so we can zero that out. Now, I had the honor of being uh, on the Israeli negotiating team in, in Paris. This was just a little footnote. However, I think we did something very, very big. The big fight, and this is, the, by the way, the most important political conference, I think, of your generation. There was a big fight going into Paris, and nobody knew if it's going to re be resolved. You have the developed world, right? Most of you live in developed countries, saying to the poor countries, oh, we've been burning things, and we got prosperous. We have everything we need. We live glorious lives with everything we need. But we just realized we, we shouldn't burn things anymore. So you don't, you, the poor countries, the majority countries in the world, you don't burn anything from now on. And the poor countries are saying, you can't tell us not to provide energy for our people. How are we going to have education? How are we going to have jobs? How are we going to have real good health care? How are we going to grow our economies? You burned your way to prosperity. Why can't we? And so one of the things I've been proud to be associated with is coming up with a third way. And that's, that's in Rwanda, which we hinted to and we'll see in a couple minutes. We built a solar field in Africa. It's the first one under President Obama's uh, Power Africa program. He's not my boss, but he's boss. <laughs> and, um, and what we did there, and this is important for you to understand that everything you know that is evil when it comes to energy, it's possible to, to change into good. What we did in Rwanda is we built a solar field that's supplying today 6% of the country's power. And it's the first time we separated out economic growth, GDP growth, from emissions growth. In other words, a poor country doesn't have to burn things to become prosperous. And this model we gifted to the world and to President Obama. And uh, thankfully, I think this is the model of the future. I want to say something to the Israeli government and to the Palestinian Authority. And I've kept my silence uh, in the last couple of years. But I, I think it's important at this moment, post Paris, to say what needs to happen and to need to happen now. In Israel, four things. And you, who have influence because you're, you're citizens of the world, maybe citizens of the country, who, who have networks, who have Facebook, you need to push for these things. The Israeli government won't allow much more solar, even though 60% of the, of the country is desert. And the, and, the, and the readings that we did, right, the readings we did of the solar panels were phenomenal. We need the Israeli government to lift the quotas to lift the permissions so that 2,000 more megawatts can, can be built. Because as entrepreneurs, we have to invest. And if we don't have horizon, then we're not going to build. And, and we, need, we need all of our voices to ask the Israeli government to allow 2,000 megawatts of solar power. The second is we need, to, we need to tax carbon. The stuff that's getting burnt 
is actually relatively cheap. But you know what? There's a health cost to society. There's an environmental cost to society. And they don't count that in there. So we need a level playing field with burning fossil fuels. The third thing is no more power plants. No more fossil power plants. From now on, every new kilowatt hour that's added to the grid in Israel needs to be a green kilowatt hour. And finally, even though the electric car failed, I think the government should provide a free charging network for any electric car from now on. And the consumers, your parents, will make the right choices. For the Palestinian Authority to President Abbas, I've been meeting the last couple of days with Palestinian solar entrepreneurs. They have the spirit, they have the knowledge, they've had the land, they have the financing. And respectfully, please approve these Palestinian solar licenses that are just waiting and lingering uh, and gathering dust on, on your desk. It's time to move forward. I do want to give a message of hope of what is possible. And as you were saying that one person can, can make a difference, and all of us together uh, can, can completely change the world. Israel today is only at 2% renewables, which is embarrassingly low. However, how many of you went on the trip down south to the Arava to see the solar fields? Just the leadership. OK, you're all invited. Uh, if I had like 20, 20 kids, you're all invited. When, when I moved to, to Israel from Boston, we had an idea in 2006. By 2020, we wanted the entire region from the, dead, from the Red Sea to the Dead Sea to be powered by the sun. No, it's pretty audacious. No one has ever done that, and the government is, was against that. Here we are in 2016, and 60% of the electricity during the day from the Red Sea to the Dead Sea is powered by the sun. And by 2020, I promise you, it's going to be 100%. And this model is a model that should inspire Israel. It should inspire our neighbors, and it should inspire Africa and the rest of the world that during the day, today, it is possible and feasible and mandatory if we're going to have any healthy, sustainable future to go solar. So thank you for uh, the opportunity of being here. And I want to show a quick video of what we did in Rwanda. And I'm open to your questions. Thank you very much. Staff get excited when they saw the USAID logo up there. Yes, they were, they were great. The future is now. What information can I help you with so that uh, you, can, you can make it a green and positive future? Yes. Can you tell me if there is already a national technology battery storage? 
Okay, the questions about technology for storage kinds of batteries. First of all, this country has a bunch of wonderful startups uh, in the storage space, and um, I'm betting on a, on a couple of them. Uh, and, and actually in the US as well, there, there's different, it's not only batteries, we usually think of storage as a battery, like, the, like I showed you, but a, but a gigantic one. GE has some phenomenal ones like that today that in some markets are great to use, Panasonic has, that can take megawatts, like can power small cities. Um, we're in final negotiations with the government of South Sudan. Uh, that Juba, the capital, will be the first African city that will have solar power during the day and solar power at night uh, with, with storage. So it's, it's borderline economically feasible, but just like your, your iPhones and the computers and everything else, the price comes down, right? The price comes down. We've seen a decrease in the cost of giant batteries every year of 16%. That's extraordinary, which basically means the next year or two, it's totally doable to do worldwide. <laughs> Dr. Fly. Why is it so difficult here solar So what, why is it so difficult in Israel? What's wrong with the bureaucracy? Look, it's a couple of things. One is it's an over-regulated society, meaning there's too many bureaucrats and government offices, 24 to be correct, to be exact, that have to sign off on this. But I, I, I want to be frank with you. Uh, we see this not just in Israel, it's around the world. Fossil fuels and the economic power that they wield in our economies are more powerful politically than green energy. And so there's a political incentive for policymakers to focus on fossil fuels, and it's the devil everybody knows. And the devil people, and not the devil, the angel that people don't yet really know on this scale, this power is a third of a lot, by the way, during the day. Um, is people need to see and to get used to. It used to be that solar power is more expensive than natural gas in this country. Today it's cheaper. They want us to subsidize them, which is not okay, which is part of the political equation. It started out as economics, then ig ignorance, then entrenched uh, interests, and that's what we're up against. Yes. Okay, so th uh, those of you who are about to go to college, what do you need to study if you want to be part of the solution? We have all sorts of people working in our office, and we have internship programs, by the way, uh, in Jerusalem for semesters and for, for summers. If you're scientifically inclined, engineering, electrical engineering, architecture engineering, those are important. If you're business-minded, get your MBA, learn economics, Get a lot of hands-on uh, experience because it's only going to be economics that's going to make the world change course, that it's going to be cheaper, right, cheaper to be able to do this than to what, what we're currently doing. So economics is good. If you like research, uh, a lot of research is needed uh, in terms of markets, uh, in terms of technologies. There's basically almost every... Anybody who has a passion for this can find a way in. But also think about your own lives, right? Just because you're going off to college doesn't exempt you, right, from making choices in your life that are greener choices. Um, when I fly, and I flew to the Paris climate talks twice because I came home for Shabbat, and so here I am burning jet fuel trying to save the world, right? That's a little bit strange, isn't it? So. We as a family do something called carbon offsets. You can go online and calculate what is your carbon footprint as a family, as a school, and figure how many trees or how many solar panels need to go out there because of you so that you can live a, a carbon neutral life. And you don't have to wait until you work to do that. These are, there are things you can do in your own life. Uh, 
uh, negative uh, repercussions for electronic cars. Well, my big fight with the uh, founders of Better Place is what's good as an electric car environmentally if you're plugging into one of the dirtiest grids in the Western world? You're just transferring where the pollution is happening. Although there was a, there was a positive, a net positive on that. Um, no, I don't think there's really that much of a negative uh, implication. Certainly not more negative than wars in the Middle East over oil and the funding of terrorism from oil and the burning uh, of oil to be able to power them. I, I don't think so at all. I, I saw a recent uh, video of a self-driving car that uh, will also go electric uh, uh, soon as well. There's, there's, there's issues of batteries, uh, there's some radiation, but when you, the, nothing is going to be pure. And don't be, a, my, my advice also is know your values, live your values to a certain vision, and, and that's an act of, of leadership. But also if you're a purist about it, there's not like something that's going to be completely, completely great. Like when they ma manufacture solar panels, they're using energy. And unfortunately, they're not using solar energy yet to manufacture solar panels. But the net positive is, is better. And electric cars, a third of our greenhouse gas emissions in this country is transportation. We should zero that out. Anybody in back? Yep. How what? Green energy? Oh, green energy in the economy in Israel will do even more than the natural gas. I know some people are surprised to hear that. Listen to this. Where are the jobs needed in, in, in Israel? It's on the periphery, right? Where, who else is going to invest in the periphery if not green energy? This kind of massive investment you're not paying for your fuel that, that you usually have to send your currency abroad or use dollars, foreign currency. In other words, your fuel is free. It's a, think about it. Your fuel is free. It will, and, and now solar fuel is cheaper than gas fuel. And so all that cost savings plus the environmental hazards in this country, if you live, anybody live near Ashdod or Ashkelon? So the amount of asthma in your area, sorry, doubles every 10 years for kids around the power plant in Ashdod, right? There's a cost to that. So it would be much better for the economy. Yeah, one, two. So electric cars are affordable. Some of them are popular, the Tesla, but it's not here. Um, here's, here's the economics. Ready? Shh. If you're driving a kilometer on gas, it will cost you 50 to 70 uh, agorot. If you do it on electricity, it's 10 to 15 agorot. So the question is, what's, there's something wrong with the system. There's something broken with the system. And in Israel, it's the same price to buy a conventional car as it is to buy an electric car, even though electric cars tend to be more expensive, because there's a tax break. If you're going to buy a regular car today, you have to pay 83% purchase tax on it, because that's how the government makes money. If you're buying an electric car, it's only 8%. It's totally worth doing it today. It's about the consumers. Don't let your parents buy the next car that's not electric. Well, it's, it's new, and so therefore we need the next generation to be early movers. She was asking why don't more people buy electric cars. Today, every major auto manufacturer is producing now an electric car, and that is a, already a revolution, but it will only happen if the consumers demand it, if you prefer it. And these are choices that all of us have influence on directly or indirectly. It's all about consumer choice at this point. Yeah, next to you. What can, a stu what can one student do? Well, again, start with yourself, figure out your own carbon footprint, and figure out maybe you need to plant five trees a year. I'm making up the number. You'll, you'll figure out the, right? How, 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 do you commute to school and how far? How many, you know, how many kilometers is that? How often do you fly abroad? You know, do you guys like barbecue all the time outside every day? Or, you know, like how are you preparing your food? So first, be be responsible for your own footprint. 
and then your family's footprint, and then maybe help this school figure out what the carbon footprint is. And I bet you there's enough roof space here where you, you can go carbon neutral. And I think that would be a great model because a lot of you are involved in the diplomatic community. And I think the ripple effects will be phenomenal. Yeah? 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 Yeah, it's, it's a legitimate question about land use versus power generation, right? And if you're an environmentalist, you also care about land. Less than 1% of the Sahara can power the whole world. Truly, just a couple square kilometers in Israel can meet all of its energy needs. This was an unused agricultural field because there's no water because of climate change. It was just baking. We've identified enough uh, land in areas A and B for half the Palestinian energy needs. And if you can work something on area C, you can be 100% solar during the day. There's enough available unused land. Now, there's new technologies coming up to be able to shrink the footprint. But this went through 23 environmental evaluations, from flowers to lizards to uh, glare for the Air Force, for everything. And it passed at the highest level every environmental consideration. Say one more time. The whole room. What is the cause? Oh, what was the cars that were using? Uh, okay, so the, when you have a battery, if you look at an electric car as really just a battery with wheels, power is usually cheaper at night. And so you can actually store on the battery. The idea was to store on the, on the cars bat um, cheap power that came at night and then use it during the day. That was one of the ideas of the electric car system. I don't know why the car, not, I mean, every car in the world should be manufactured with solar panels at this point, at least for the air conditioning and the, uh, and the, uh, and the radio to, to get started. Yep. Great question. What's the solar efficiency? In other words, the way it works, there are these massive nuclear explosions on the sun. And it, it, and, and it sends out photons streaming through the galaxy. Anybody know how long it takes to get here? Eight minutes. It comes in. And it hits the solar panel like the ones I saw outside. And these panels, about 15% of the light that hits it gets absorbed and turned into, into photons. Now, there are higher efficiency solar panels, but they're actually more expensive. And so there's a bit of a balance uh, on it. But uh, Boeing, I heard Boeing. Boeing Spectrolabs hit, I think, 42% efficiency in the, uh, in the lab. And they're powering, of course, the satellites. And, which, and so you can, you can go higher and higher. Um, the new solar panels will be about 20% uh, efficient, which is fine. We're, we're cheaper than natural gas. OK? One or two last questions? How am I going to convince? How are you going to convince? How are you going to? What's your name? Ashley, how are you going to convince all these people to buy electric cars? <laughs> truly, truly. We don't own a car as a family, by the way. And I won't get a car unless it's electric. And I won't get an electric car unless I can charge it with the sun. And that's final. Yeah. What would you say to the 
my, uh, my vegan friends have this chart, and, and I'm sure it's in principle true. I don't know about the numbers. They say 51% of greenhouse gas emissions is related to the, to, the, um, to, to the meat industry. I'm sure it's significant. It's significant uh, for so many reasons, from the production of food to what the animals do, uh, uh, so to speak. And um, uh, Meatless Mondays, if you can do that, and then meatless to add Meatless Tuesdays and, uh, and, and keep going, will actually have a very positive uh, benefit. Um, but still, most is really because of greenhouse gas emissions from power plants, and that's where policy, I don't know if we can legislate uh, food, because those are individual choices, but energy policy, as Secretary Kerry said, is the solution uh, from a policy perspective for, for global warming. All right, we are so counting on you. There's no more time left. And um, Lu Luima and Alexandra, you totally rock. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Give a good for being here. Okay. Like to give you. Oh, I wanted one of the bat ones. I wanted, okay. No. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Good luck. We're counting on you. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for your attention. Um, I know you've been sitting a long time, so I'll try to make this brief. Um, I'm Mary Westcott, and I'm one of the uh, directors of Gaia WBAIS with Dr. Fly. Um, and I have the privilege, or should I say daunting task, of closing our symposium by thanking all of those who made tonight and Gaia possible. Um, on behalf of Gaia WBAIS, I would first like to express our sincere thanks and appreciation to Russell Elwanger of Tower Jazz. Tower Jazz, Russell, could you stand please? Thank you so much. Tower Jazz has been a backbone of our program continuing into the seventh year with unwavering corporate support. Special thanks also to Dorit Dahan, Vice President of Tower Jazz, and Yaakov Rosen, head scientist at Tower Jazz. Another Elwanger, although she could not be here tonight, deserves many thanks and recognition. Margaret Elwanger, who is Russell's wife and the third Gaia director here at WBAIS, has given countless hours of her time and energy to the students of Gaia. This year, Margaret challenged our Gaia junior students to raise funds for the children of African asylum seekers in South Tel Aviv. Our Gaia junior students raised 10,000 shekels, which Margaret matched with a one-to-one -one donation for a total of 20,000 shekels to donate to this worthy cause. Well done, congratulations. Thank you to all the participating Gaia schools. Thank you students, you guys are amazing and I'm extremely proud of you all. Advisors, especially our very own uh, Jan Abraham and Kelly Chappelle, our Gaia Junior Directors, and Leslie Geyer, um, Director of Gaia Scouts. Thank you to our speakers, Ambassador Shapiro, Thank you SPNI and Ramat Hanadi for your ongoing and continued support of our program. Thank you to the designers who came this evening to show off and sell your merchandise. Thank you moms and dads of Gaia students for the food for tonight's dinner and for your uh, support throughout the year. And a very special thank you to thank you to one super mom, Sharon Cohen, who helped with all the logistics for tonight. Without her help, we would have never been able to pull off um, this event. Last but not least, to the man who dreams big, puts his dreams into actions, and created Gaia, the Gaia Project seven years ago. He has unending energy, is truly inspirational, and is the heart and soul of the Gaia Project. Dr. Stuart Fleischer. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. On behalf, that's right, he deserves it.
On behalf of WBAIS Gaia, we wish you a good evening. As you leave, you are welcome to take one of the sneakers or shoes with the plants inside. They are for you to bring home. Thank you so much, everyone.